Praise the Lord, saints. This is Brian Fox, and we are continuing on on our series entitled Fear Not, for I've redeemed thee. Our text scripture is Isaiah chapter 43, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Once again, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Praise the Lord. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, and Saba for thee. Since thou was precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable. I have loved thee, therefore I will give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east, and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even every one that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for everything that you're doing in our lives. And right now we ask for you to speak to us through your word. We give you the praise, honor, and glory, Father, for all the things that you're showing us in this time and season. We thank you for your hand of protection being upon us. We thank you for uh, the incredible ways in which you touch and oversee and guide our lives. And we just thank you, Father, that even in the midst of adversity, your love, your faithfulness, your provision, your healing, everything that we need, Father, is being delegated unto us, Lord. So right now we proclaim that we put our trust in you and we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I said, we're looking at fear not, for I've redeemed thee as our text scripture, and over the last few weeks we looked at several several subtopics. First one was that uh, during our encounters with fear, God speaks to us. The question is, are we listening? And then we look at the fact that uh, it's important for us to understand who exactly is speaking. And our text scripture says, thus saith the Lord. And he goes on to show through his word, as well as in the ways in, in which I share some scriptures, the fact that he is the only true God. He is the one who is all powerful. He can do anything that he wills when he desires to. But are we trusting him as the one or are we allowing other voices, our own fears and anxieties, the news conversations that we hear? Are we allowing those things to have a greater significance or priority and precedence in our lives than what God is speaking in this time and season. So we have to ensure that if there's anything that is reducing or dissipating uh, the, the power and authority that we view from God, that we have to put in its proper position. God is the one that's all powerful and can do whatever he wants to turn around our situations. Amen. Uh, we went on. We looked at the fact that God proclaimed that I created and formed you. God not only knows all the attributes associated with us, he also knows the weaknesses I, that we have, the things that we will encounter over the course of our lives. He has a plan, uh, a purpose in which he created us. Amen. So he didn't form and fashion us uh, lackadaisically or uh, without any thought in mind. He did it with a purpose and a plan. And as we saw, he knew us intimately, even in our mother's womb, and he desired uh, end result for our lives. That being the case, he is totally aware of the things that we're going through in every phase of our lives, and either he's given us the capacity to endure and overcome those things, not only through our innate attributes, but also with the spiritual gifts, the insight from his word, and the power of the Holy Spirit. But he's also aware that in, in certain times we might need aid from other people or other resources. That being the case, he is the one who's able to supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. And then we close with talking about uh, the fact that we cannot fear anything, sickness, disease, the economy, 
Amen. We have to fear and give the most reverence, in other words, to God our Father. And then we close with the fact that we have to have rationality in the midst of fear. You can't allow yourself to just run in haste, to allow your anxieties to overwhelm your mind so that you make a bad situation worse, or that you just throw in a towel and, and give in and say, this is going to be the end of me. You have to allow your rationality, amen, which comes from the Word of God, amen. He makes you sober. He makes you uh, view things from His perspective, and that gives you the capability that instead of um, flipping out or freaking out, as people will say, you would look at things in light of Scripture, and He will uh, govern your mind and your thoughts and your perceptions so that you can endure the storms of life that you face. We continue on this week, and one of the things that God said in his text scripture is that I have redeemed it. Amen? That's an important phrase. Uh, the underlying Hebrew word for redeem translates to next of kin. Do you realize that you're a child of God? He doesn't see you as some uh, stranger or some aloof person that he doesn't care about. You're not uh, somebody that lives in the neighborhood or somebody miles and miles away that he checks in on once in a while. No, God is saying in his word that I consider you my next of kin when you're a child of God. You're part of my family. And you're not just an adoptee that, or a foster child that he looks into once in a while or he does it because he has to. God does it because he values you. Amen? That phrase uh, or that word redeem not only talks about next of kin, it also talks about somebody who buys back a, a relative's property, one who marries a widow so that she's not left alone to fend for herself, somebody who pays a ransom, or somebody who serves as an avenger or a deliverer. God is all those things to his children, amen? He's not only our father, but he has a kinship with us in which when we're caught up or bound by a situation, he liberates us. Uh, there's a debt that we need to pay, even if it's self-inflicted. He's the one that redeems or buys back our possessions, our peace of mind, our health. You know, if somebody has wronged us, God is the avenger or the deliverer. Amen? So let's go to a passage of scripture where we're going to look at this a little further. Isaiah chapter 44, and we're going to look at verses 24 through 28. Once again, Isaiah 44, verses 24 through 28. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens above, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah ye shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed places thereof, that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Let's look at this. Once again, God says that I am not only your Redeemer and he that formed thee from the womb, but I am the Lord that makes all things. You know, we might be dealing with various situations, but at the end of the day, everything, not only on the planet Earth, but the entire universe consists of things that God himself set the pattern or the foundation for those things to be formed. We saw in the Word of God that Jesus turned water into wine. We saw that he walked on water. He was not subject to the things of this earth, you know, temporal and tangible things. He had power and authority to transform those things into whatever he needed them to be. So we might be dealing with various things in this current situation. Uh, Jesus needed money one time. He had a coin come out of the mouth of a fish. You know, once again, he turned water to wine. God is not afraid, concerned by or dismayed by sickness and disease. And even though we might be dealing with a worldwide pandemic, God can transform, translate, destroy, uh, alter uh, the, the foundation or the principles by which that virus operates. God can do whatever he wants. He's not alarmed or dismayed, and he has the power and authority to overcome.
overcome anything that comes our way. Uh, we saw here, uh, once again, that word redeemer is very important. And quite frankly, most of us in our modern day society truly don't understand what it means to be uh, redeemed. God is not only promising us to be next of kin, but he's actually uh, professing this over us from the oriental um, law of kinship or what some people uh, refer to from time to time as the Leverit or Levirate um, marriage. And what that means is that if you're left abandoned, I will come and I will provide all the resources you need. If you've been divorced, I will marry you. If you've been pulled into slavery or, or even in your own foolish decisions, if you've uh, put yourself into um, indentured servitude or a form of slavery because you cannot sustain yourself and pay off your debt to somebody, God says, I am the one who will liberate you. Uh, once again, if somebody has wronged you, hurt you, even shed the, your blood, God says, I am the one who will come in and redeem you. I will make those people pay for what they did to you. And we're not asking God to lash out uh, punishment upon people. Amen. You know, he's also a God of mercy. But the reality is uh, people should be afraid. The devil should be afraid. Anything that comes against a child of God should be fearful, not about what we can do, but what our holy, righteous, all-powerful God can do um, uh, on our regard. And you got to understand that, that that principle of oriental um, kinship, that law of redemption and being a redeemer. Uh, during those times, if you did not fulfill your responsibility to redeem, avenge, or buy back one who has been sold into slavery, it was considered a curse upon the person who failed to honor that duty and that responsibility. And also, it was a way in which the person was seen as a disgrace if he did not honor his responsibility to his next of kin. Do you believe that God would um, have people view him as cursed or lacking character, being disgraced because he did not fulfill his responsibility to you? That's absolutely absurd. God, amen, is the supplier of all things. He's the redeemer, the giver of life. Uh, as we saw, he's also a loving God that formed and fashioned us with a divine purpose. Why in the world would he sit back and watch idly while the world system or the economy and other things tear us apart without coming to our assistance. So God, therefore, always is stepping in to take um, care of those who, he, who know him as their Lord and Savior. Now we're going to go on, and, and he says here, further in this verse, I am the one that not only makes all things, I stretch forth the heavens alone. He's telling us, you can look up at the sky and see how powerful I am. Look at the constellations. Look at the star bodies. Scientists are looking further and further out in space and, and seeing all these wondrous things. We used to think that we lived in the center of uh, just the Milky Way galaxy and this was it. And as scientists became more aware of things, they found that there's multiple galaxies out there. And the further out in space we look, more things we see that are out there and available for us to try to grasp. God is the creator of all those things. And if he created all those things, you mean to tell me that he can't take care of us in this time of season? Once again, that's absurd. God has the power to do all things. If he can stretch out the heavens, uh, solar systems, if he can create planetary bodies and comets, black holes, and all the things we see in space, obviously God has the power, amen, to turn your life around, to heal you if you're sick, to give you all the needs you need on a daily basis to sustain yourself. Uh, he goes on and he says, he frustrates the tokens. Uh, you can think of that as the schemes, uh, the plans, uh, the, the weapons that the liars are hurling your way. He talks about uh, when people are divining or scheming against you, he makes them mad. That's not only a literal anger, but there's times where people might literally go crazy trying to attack you and they can't find a way to overcome you. He says further here that he makes the wisdom of the wise man seem like it's backwards. They think they figure things out. The reality is God is the only one that knows all things. And he goes further to say, I make their knowledge foolish. We spend too much time 
listening to what this person is saying, that person is saying. The reality is, it's fine for us to be aware of information. We need to be abreast of the times and seasons that we're in, but realize that we're serving somebody with the type of um, imagination, the type of knowledge that, you know, the greatest of scientists, the greatest of geniuses, amen, they're all stunned in comparison to the wisdom of God. Amen. So we need to trust in him as the one who gives us all the perceptions that we need to view various situations. Uh, he, he will show us how to prepare and plan for the things that we're currently dealing with as well as the things that are yet to come. And he gives us the ability to be sober, stable minded as things emerge instead of us being frightened and alarmed or giving up on ourselves or him. Amen. All right, let's go look at another passage of Scripture. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 41, and we're going to read verses 14 through 20. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and shall make the hills as chafe. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places, and fountains in the midst of the valleys, I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shitta tree, and the myrtle, and the oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together, that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Man, this is amazing. Previously, we've been looking at the power of God in the midst of adversity. And he shows us that I am the one who created the heavens. I am also the one that even in your mother's womb, you may not have had arms and legs yet and just been a fertilized egg. God says, I knew you intimately. I formed and fashioned you with a plan, an end of your journey. You know, the word calls Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. We see that God is present at the beginning of our lives as well as the end and that being the case and him being an author he is aware of every chapter of your life and just as we see a read a book or see a movie and you know most movies even comedies have some form of adversity in the middle that makes you wonder oh are they going to be able to get out of this situation or are they going to end this in a successful uh, fashion there's a plot that goes on in the midst of a book or a movie but a lot of times at the end, you know, the hero wins and there's a great outcome that everybody can celebrate. You know, unfortunately, in some movies, uh, there's a bad ending. Uh, we've seen that from time to time, even though it's, it's more rare. But the reality is, in God's plot, in the book that he wrote regarding your life, it's guaranteed victory. And you are assured that God's going to turn things around for his glory and honor and for a testimony unto your life. You know, so um, here we see that, uh, that God that talks about his power to stretch and create, to mold, to transform, to destroy, to do whatever he wants according to his will. But the great thing about Isaiah 41 is that he tells us, I'm going to turn you around instead of you sitting there being buffeted by the times, the circumstances, and the uncertainty of your life. He says, I'm going to make you a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. You're not going to be toothless. <laughs> God's going to give you courage. He's going to give you what they call a backbone. Uh, There's going to be times that God's going to step in and do things himself, but God is actually telling us here, he's going to make us lean, mean fighting machine. Amen? You're not going to, once again, just be buffeted by the circumstances of life. God is going to transform you so that you can go out and devastate your enemies. Look what he says here. First of all, I'm going to make you a new, sharp, threshing instrument. 
Were you dulled before by the circumstances of life? Were you beaten down and you had dents um, and other defects that prevented you from walking in power and authority and, and success? God says, I'm going to transform you into something new, something that you may not have seen before. You might see an authority, a power, a wisdom, a strength, an anointing coming out of you that you've never seen before. But sometimes uh, it only comes forth during these times of, of, of devastation, uh, of, of discouragement. God says, I'm going to transform you into something new. I'm going to make you sharp, amen, so that you can cut through all the chaos and all the dysfunction. I'm going to make you a new instrument, once again, that has teeth. You're not going to go out like you may have done before and been toothless. People didn't hear what you had to say. Uh, people looked at you as inadequate, not having the capability to do anything that was worth um, uh, uh, respecting. But God says, I'm going to make you somebody that is sharp, a new instrument that has teeth to cut through things. Then he says, hey, there might be mountains in your life. I'm going to give you the power, the power to thresh those mountains. You're going to cut through them. And then he goes on and says, even though they were previously mountains, you're going to beat them small. Amen. That's a powerful statement from God. You might have had mountains in your lives. Amen. That you thought you would never get around or go over. God says, I'm giving you the power that you're going to beat those things down. You're going to have the teeth to cut through those things. And even though they might have seemed to be so enormous that you can never overcome them, God says you're going to tear them down and you're going to cut through them. And then he says you'll fan them and the wind will carry those things away. God gives you the power to overcome them and blow those things out of existence as it relates to your life. Amen. That's a powerful statement. It's one in which we need to be rejoicing in the Lord. And matter of fact, that's what it tells us in verse 16. Not only will we be given the power by God to overcome the things that were in our lives. But he says, you will rejoice in the Lord and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. Why is that important? There's going to be a lot of times in the midst of adversity that the problems, the trials and tribulations that you're facing are not yours alone. As we're seeing right now during this pandemic, we all have a mutual problem. There was times early on in our lives that one person might be jobless, Another person might be going through some type of sickness or, or divorce or other crisis. And while you might say, well, I sympathize with you, you couldn't quite understand the problem that the person was dealing with. We're currently in a situation where we're all sharing a mutual problem that we all have to take certain steps to ensure that we all come out of this uh, alive and, and with the resources and the wisdom that God wants us to grow in from this. Uh, so anybody, amen, can go out now. You can talk to a total stranger and have a conversation about the coronavirus and how it's affecting your lives. But we, we see here, we can have a different mindset. They might talk about the coronavirus only, only with doom, gloom, and fear. We can go out and talk about the same crisis and say, I know it's something that I could have to um, look at wisely and respectfully, but I'm also rejoicing in the fact that my God is going to sustain me, protect me, heal me if necessary. Whatever he needs to do, I'm going to glory in the fact that I serve God and I don't have to be full of fear in the midst of the current crisis that we're all facing. Then it says here, the poor and needy seek water and there is none. Um, and God talks about how he's giving people the provision they need. Are you thirsty? God can give you water. Are you hungry? Hungry. At the end of the day, God is the one that can provide the food you need. Do you need shelter? Whatever you need, God can give it to you and not only give you what you need, but give you the capacity to touch the lives of other people who mutually share your problem. He not only says that he'll give you what you need, but he won't give it just out of what is presently there. We see here clearly in verse 18, in the midst of the dry land, I will make springs of water. In the midst of the wilderness, I will provide a pool of water. God is not limited by the, the resources that are at a particular location. Once again, he can create something out of thin air. So if we need it, all we have to do is truly trust God 
And once again, he is our provider. He is the one who will see through it. So God not only redeems us, he empowers us, as we saw here, not to sit back and be passive, not to lay around in fetal position saying, oh, woe is me, I can't get out of bed. No, God says, I'm going to make you valiant warriors who have the ability to fight against the adversity that threatens to consume us. And not only fight against it, but overcome it and send it fleeing away from us. In other words, you'll make that virus fear you instead of the other way around. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, our next text uh, passage, or, I'm sorry, subtopic that we're looking at from our text scripture, God says, I called you by thy name. Amen. Not only does he say, fear not, but he says, I've called you by your name. That When he's talking about calling you, God is saying that I recognize you on a personal and intimate level, but also I'm beckoning you to come to me, approach me, in other words. Don't sit there surrounded by your problems, rolling around in the muck and mire of defeatism, discouragement, and allowing fear to overcome you. Approach me, because I'm surely calling you. Once again, God is calling. Are you hearing his voice, and are you approaching him in response to it? You know, we look at a parent that's outside with a child. That child is, is about to do something that could lead to harm. The parent will call the child and say, come here. And the responsive child is, is wise enough to heed the voice of their parent and turn around from what danger they were facing and come into ar to the arms of the, the embrace or the proximity of their protective parent. There's also times where a child will stumble and fall, you know, cut their knee, uh, have a bruise, and the parent will call them and say, hey, come here, let me look at that. You know, let me do what's necessary to bring you back to wholeness or to settle you down because right now you're upset about the things that you're facing. A parent will call you for multiple reasons. Let's look at a passage of scripture that shows how God is calling unto his children in this time and season. Revelation 2, verse 17 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden man, and will give him a new stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. That's incredible. God says, hear what the Spirit is saying. Do you realize that the Spirit is speaking to you right now during this crisis? And God says to him that overcomes, I'm going to give you a hidden manner, things that you can consume and absorb that only those who walk in the overcoming of power of God get to eat. Do you want to eat of the, the riches and the hidden manner of God? Another thing he says is that I'm going to give you a white stone. One of the things that they used to do when they were judging a, a crime or an offense before a council of elders or a body of judges, they would hear the case, they would hear the, the, the witnesses, and if you were guilty, they would place before you a black stone. But if you were found innocent or absolved of your crime, they would place a white stone before you to say that you, we view you as righteous or absolved of your guilt. God says here that I'm going to not only call you, but I'm going to give you a white stone. Amen. And not just any old stone that you find outside. He says, I'm going to give you a white stone that indicates that you are righteous and absolved of any sin or guilt. And on that stone, I'm going to write a new name, which no man will know except the person that receives that stone. God's going to give you uh, a name that only he knows. Amen. You'll get your personal nickname, your personal, um, you know, phrase or, or, or name that God gives you. Uh, sometimes parents will call their kids baby or, or whatever, or dear, or, or various things. Um, but a lot of times those things are shared. God says, I'm giving you a new name that is unique to you. And to, to, quite frankly to me, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. I love my name. Uh, I've never changed my name from Brian Fox, but the reality is, Last time I've checked, and I've seen this during mortgage refinances, is that the last time I believe there's at least uh, six or seven Brian Foxes just in the state of New Jersey alone. 
when I went to get a website with my name, I found out that there's a Brian Fox who is a, is a voiceover actor. Then there's another one that's an author. There's even a Brian Fox that created a computer language. There's a lot of Brian Foxes out there, amen? So it's great that even though I love my name, my name is not totally unique. There's other people alive right now, even within my own state, that share it. So if God was to call out Brian Fox, there could be six or seven people in New Jersey alone that will respond. If he called it out across the United States, my goodness, there could be hundreds or even thousands of Brian Foxes. But when he calls me according to that new name, which is written out on that white stone, there's only one person that's going to respond, and that's going to be me. Amen? And God has given each one of us that. It shows us how personal, how unique uh, each one of us is. I told you last week that God loves us so intimately that he's aware of the number of hairs that are on our, our head. We see here, here he takes it to a new level of being personal with us, giving each one of us a new name that nobody else shares. So when God is calling you and ushering you forth, you know, he's speaking to you, he's calling unto you, and the great thing is he's providing you protection as you're embarking on your journey, but he's also watching from behind so that the enemy cannot sucker punch you um, or pounce on you without you being aware that that attack is coming. We're going to look at that in our next passage of scripture. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 52, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 12. Isaiah 52, verses 9 through 12. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your re-reward. Now, there's something in this passage of scripture that I'm sure a lot of people have read a lot of times but didn't fully understand exactly what it's saying. Um, so I did, you know, necessary resource, I'm sorry, research to figure out exactly what it means. And what I'm talking about is that in verse 10 of this passage of scripture, it says, The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. Now, before I go further into the holy arm, it says he has made his holy arm bare in the eyes of all the nations. In other words, everybody is seeing God laying his arm bare. This is important because whether or not you're a supporter of the God and his people or you're against God and his people, God is saying, I'm allowing all of you to see the fact that that I am laying bare my holy arm. And why is that important? Uh, the best way to, to illustrate this is that uh, people that are out in the desert, you know, sometimes uh, Arabs and caravans and things like that, they wear um, clothing. And a lot of times we're amazed because, like, man, why are they wearing things that cover their entire body or cover their entire arms? But the reality is uh, these sleeves, for instance, are loose. And they might have outer garments. Like I said, they have the sleeve. So what they do is, if they're in a situation where they're about to face confrontation, they lay their arms bare by sliding up their sleeves quickly uh, on their arm so that they go up closer to their shoulder. And when they're laying that arm bare, they're basically demonstrating to the opponent or the potential opponent that if you either attack me or if I felt led that I must um, strike you, I'm removing any type of restriction from my arm's movement by sliding up my sleeve and laying my arm bare. So when God is laying his arm bare, 
He's showing to those who, who love him that I'm preparing myself, that if I have to strike, I'm going to do it, and there's going to be no barrier, no restriction to whatever I start, start to do and intend to do against my enemies. He's also showing a warning to those who are against him or his people that if you keep up what you're doing, I'm going to take the restrictions off my arm and I'm going to suddenly and quickly strike you and there will be no, nothing to restrain or to hinder what I decide to do when I strike you. So this is something that if you're an enemy of God, this is a warning that righteous and tremendous judgment is going to be swiftly rendered upon you if you don't retreat or stop your advances against my people. Think of that. God is laying bare his holy arm, amen, ready to strike if necessary. And once again, not only strike, but strike quickly and without any restriction whatsoever to the movement that he feels is necessary to defend, uh, to save, to restore, or to liberate his people. This is what God is doing for each one of us. All right, our next subtopic topic I'm going to look for today, look at today, is God says that when you pass through the waters, amen, he talks about us passing through the waters, and he talks about when we pass through the water, he will be with us. He won't allow us to go through that water by ourselves. And the, the important thing that we need to look at from this passage of, of Scripture, it says, when thou passest through the water. In other words, the word when, it implies a required action from the people of God. When you pass through the water. In other words, in the moment that you start passing through the water, I will be with you. God realizes that there's going to be storms of life, things that are perilous, uh, things that we don't necessarily want to walk through or deal with, that we can't get to the next phase of our journey in God until we decide to get up from our pity pots, get up from our place of apathy or fear, and start to move in faith in the direction that God is guiding us. But the promise that God is giving us is that I operate by faith. I'm not going to unleash or delegate my power upon you as long as you're standing there or laying there in fear. However, when you start to move and pass through the waters, that's when you'll see the full demonstration that I'm with you. Yes, am I with you when you're not moving? Of course. But if you want to see my power and my influence um, and what I can do in your life um, on a personal level and in the moment, it's when you respond to the when, the moment, and you start to move in the direction that God is calling you. So once again, the when implies a required action. And God is saying that I will keep my promise to be with you so as long as you don't stay frozen in fear, dormant in your gifts, and stagnant in regard to the calling that I have on your life or for your life and the direction that I'm taking you through. Let's look at an example of that from the faith chapter of God's Word. Hebrews 11.29 By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Notice that key phrase. It says, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea. A lot of us looked at the Ten Commandments movie, uh, read the story, and we say, hey, Moses, you know, took his rod, he slammed it down on the edge of that body of water, the body of water opened up, and they went through. End of story. No, God is saying, I see it from a different perspective. And that doesn't mean that, that Moses didn't do that thing. But God says the reason that you were able to pass through the Red Sea is not just because I just loosed my power to part a body of water. He says, no, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as if it was dry land. So God did it, in other words, in agreement with the faith that Moses, his servant, uh, Aaron, and the various people that had faith in him, that was the thing that merged together to release the miracle that caused the parting 
of the Red Sea. Could God have done it all by himself? Of course he could. But God is not going to honor us sitting back and being held captive by fear. God says you want my power to be loose in your life. It has to be done via the channel or through the fuel of faith. So here it says by faith, not fear, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as if it was dry, grand, dry land. And then it says on the other side of the coin, when the Egyptians tried to do the same thing, they were drowned. They didn't have the faith, nor did they have the backing of God to be able to um, go through that miraculous process. So God honored their faith and enabled them to get through and to the other side. So um, that's something we got to do right now. We got to truly walk in faith. And I know it's hard from time to time. You know, sometimes we keep hearing more and more bad news. And I guess sometimes you need to turn off the bad news and stick your head in the Word of God and encourage yourself on your most holy faith by uh, reading the stories of God and, and seeing his exploits and the things that he did in his feet in, in, in the lives of his people. A perfect place to go, um, even looking at our last passage of scripture, is to go to Hebrews chapter 11 and see all the things that happened by faith from Genesis all the way through the New Testament. We see that Abraham did things by faith. You know, so it goes on and on uh, in that faith chapter. So if you feel like you're being drowned, in sorrow or other issues that you're facing. You know, God can level the storms. He can block or divert the floods in your life. He can place you on dry ground, but your responsibility is you have to walk in faith. I'm going to look at one more subtopic for today. He not only talked about when you pass through the waters, he'll be with you, but then he says, when you pass it through the fire, he will also be with us. So let's look at when we pass through the fire. Um, first passage we're going to look at is 1 Peter chapter 4. And we'll look at t verses 12 through 19. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory God, glorify God on his behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it, be for, if it first begin at us, what shall the end of be of them that obey not the glory of the gospel of God? Amen? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So we see here that, you know, there's going to be times that you're facing trials that seem to be very fiery. But we see here that it also says, that we don't, shouldn't treat it as it's a, some strange thing that's unique to us that nobody ever, ever dealt with before. You know, we're dealing with a, a global pandemic. <laughs> Look at the times of, 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 of Egypt when they were dealing with 10 plagues. You want to talk about something that will really make your hair um, stand up on the back of your, your, your neck. Amen. They dealt with 10 things. We're dealing with one. And I know we have a lot more people on the planet now, but... Once again, you know, think it not a strange thing. You know, we've seen this throughout history, the Spanish flu, the bubonic plague, uh, smallpox, and different diseases that have uh, struck and gone through and, and, and affected 
thousands, tens of thousands, or even millions of people. Don't think of this as being a strange thing. And you might go further and say, well, but look at the economy. Look at the unemployment rising. You know, that we've had recessions and we also have had a Great Depression. This is not something that we're the only ones who ever have ever dealt with it. And if we look back, you know, quite frankly, at the things that happened uh, over the centuries or even in the last hundred years, people dealt with adversity and yet they were able to endure. I've seen testimonies. There's this um, older gentleman who was born during the year of the Spanish flu. He went through the world wars. He went through some of the epidemics, the recessions, the depression. Uh, he even contracted the coronavirus and survived that. That gentleman will tell you <laughs> without a shadow of a doubt, you can survive, you can endure. Saw a testimony of a 90 year, year old woman who contracted the coronavirus at the very first place where it really started to explode in the United States. She is still here alive and well, and I believe she's back with her fam family now spending time after surviving the coronavirus. They showed at least her and a daughter at her bedside as she was being interviewed. So these people have endu endured these things. That woman specifically, I'm not sure about the man, but that woman, she basically said that she felt the hand of God touch her. She was communicating with God throughout the process. And it got to this one point where it seemed she wouldn't make it, but she, you know, continued to communicate with God. And she said she literally felt, you know, his touch, his hand upon her to heal her body. You know, what do you do when you're facing the fiery trials of life? Do you sit there and murmur, complain, moan and groan about, oh, this is just me and I'm the only one who's ever dealt with this and nobody understands? Once again, we're all facing something right now that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the same way people are looking back on 911 and they can recall what they were doing then when it first occurred. We're going to look back at this later on um, and, and say, man, I remember when this first hit. You know, how everybody was afraid. But I would hope that we all look back at this moment in time and say, I trusted God. I professed God. I witnessed God. You know, I didn't sit there and feel sorry for myself. No, I said, this is just one of the things of life that we endure and encounter sometimes. But I rejoiced in God and saw that as me being associated with and, and being able to grasp some of the things that my precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, had to endure while he was here. And the great thing is that, you know, I was able to do it knowing that Jesus has given me the power, the authority to speak his word, to trust him, to speak to God, and to realize that he's going to enable me to endure and overcome all these things. One of the things we do see here is it talks about the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. You know, we're dealing with warfare now. You know, all the, the, the perks and, and the gimmicks and the, the bling and the, uh, the commercialism and, the, you know, 10 steps to prosperity there or five steps to being your best you there. You know, a lot of that stuff is going to go by the wayside. We're in a war now. We're talking about a global pandemic that they're saying this could be the first wave and yet there could be another wave in the fall. We got to be sober. We got to arm ourselves with the word of God. We have to know our spiritual weapons and we got to be able to know how to endure now in a positive and godly manner so we can testify and witness the people that are uh, terrorized and struck with fear right now. We got to be the ones that are able to speak into their lives and take advantage of this situation for the glory of God. And for his kingdom. And we should be working to grow his kingdom right now. You know, we're in the stores. Speak to people. And if we overhear something and we're engaged in a conversation, they're fearful. We need to be sparking hope in them and trusting God and guiding them into this. And we also have to be um, wise. Even though things might dissipate some and things might seem to get back to normal uh, once the warmer months come. They're saying June and July. You know, we might be back to life as normal with everybody roaming the streets and going to the beaches and the movie theaters and everything. But don't forget what we're dealing with right now. Don't walk in fear for the future, but we still should be mindful that this can come back in the fall or the winter and we must be prepared. Amen. We must be like the ant and we must fortify ourselves in terms of our resources, but even more so, 
fortify ourselves in God so that we're more prepared than ever before for what is yet to come. This is the time for warfare. This is the time for saints to know their weapons of their warfare and to sharpen and hone and know how to use them. And this is what we need to do going forward. We're going to close with one more passage of Scripture. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, we always want to see the good side of Jesus and the, the pleasant. And he's there with a the sheep or laying with a, a, you know, a lamb and a lion. And, you know, those things are all true. But uh, Jesus is also one, as we see here, that as his day is appearing and we're getting near the end of times, it says that he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. What does that mean? We look at a refiner's fire, um, looking at the process of purifying gold. You know, that gold could be a solid bar. They will melt it down with an intense heat. And once it melts down, the impurities or the dross floats to the surface and they skim it away. And then they allow it to cool down and harden again. And when they analyze it, if they see that it does not have the purity that they desire, they melt that, that gold down again, take it through the same process. And they'll do this over and over again until they get it to exactly where they want it. You know, in other words, they test it to see if it has the purity that they desire. Unfortunately for us, you know, we live in a, a softer, modernized time where people don't want to go through any types of trials and tribulations. We complain and we automatically say, oh, the devil must be doing this to me. No, I'm here to tell you today that God is, is taking us through a process right now that he's allowing the saints of God to go through a fire. And he's not going to use the fire to destroy us. He'll use the fire to purify us. So there's certain things we're dealing with right now. Amen. We can't um, have the comfort of assembling together like we desire. We're not able to go to the stores or walk the streets or go visit with our friends as, as we might want to do. But that's part of the refinement process. There's a fire that's coming upon us right now. We might see this being uh, just the devil and the coronavirus. You might call it uh, a result of 5G or you know technology, or you might say it's a bioweapon. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. God has allowed this to happen in this time and season. And I don't believe that God just allowed it because he didn't have anything to do and you know, just I'll just sit back and just watch and see what transpires. No, God is expecting some refinement to come out of this process, that his saints will be more sharp and more trusting of him, that we'll know how to use our weapons and to witness more effectively than ever before, that we would not resent or run for the, from the fire, but the same way Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not afraid to go into the fiery furnace. Right now, we're going through the furnace of the coronavirus and unemployment. And, and lack in the stores and lack in some homes and, and fear surrounding us on every side. It's a fire, but the fire is not meant to consume and destroy us. It is only made to sharpen us, to hone us, and to purify us. Let some of the dross in our life float to the surface that God can skim it off. And when things cool down, find that we're more pure and sharpened than ever before. And the last thing I want to look at from this is it says that uh, he's like a, not only a refiner's fire, but like fuller's soap. 
best way to look at that is that years ago, uh, people used to work in coal mines, and they would come out of the mines, they would be covered from head to toe with the dust um, and the dirt of, of, of all those things. You know, people working in oil fields dealt with the same thing, just literally covered from head to toe with, with soot or ashes, uh, the, the, the particles from the process, and literally oil itself. So when they came home, the only way to cleanse their bodies thoroughly was not with regular soap. They had to use what was called fuller soap. It was gritty. You, know, you could feel the grains that were in the soap as you were scrubbing your body. And you would literally scrub away a layer of skin so that all the dirty, soiled, oily skin on the surface of your body was removed. And then you'd have fresh, new skin, you know, beneath that was clean. Amen. So it seemed like the soap was just move, removing the dirt on the top of you. But a lot of times it would, because of its graininess, remove the top layer of your skin so that the unsoiled skin that was beneath would be now on the surface. You know, and, and, and we're, God is taking us through the same thing. You know, we got a lot of soot and dirt. And the ashes and the decay of the world system sitting on top of the surface of our lives right now. God has given us a good scrubbing through this. You know, we have to look at things and, and say, hey, have I truly been trusting him and proclaiming him and most of all representing him um, to the best manner before the world? And a lot of times the church has been found lacking, but as we're going through this process right now, it's a time to reflect. It's a time to scrub off some of the dirt and the muck and the mire. Uh, scrub off some of the resemblance to the world system. And once again, as we're uh, being taken through the fire, that's the thing. God will take you through the fire whether you want to or not. So you might as well trust him and thank him and do it with the right attitude. God is taking us through a refining fire right now. But thank God he can melt us down. In some cases, take away the hardness from our heart and how we viewed other believers or those who were unsaved. You know, melt down all those impurities, allow them to float to the surface so he can skim them off or scrub them off if it's a full of soap and bring out a, a, a body of believers that are more pure and more representative of him and glowing in the radiance of the glory of God than we've ever seen before. So I'm going to stop there right now, and I just praise God that you continue to trust Him, continue to pray in faith. Uh, in those times of uncertainty where you're being discouraged or you hear something that makes you feel anxious, go back to God's Word and read some of the chapters relating to faith. Read the Psalms and Proverbs especially, amen, that gives you um, insight to the principles of God about how He's a defender and an avenger. Um, a tower of strength, a refuge in time of trouble, a healer, deliverer, uh, a provider, all the things you need. Go through the word and allow this time and season to draw you closer to him and having a mindset more similar to his. Praise God for that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for everything you're doing in our lives. And right now, we thank you, Father, in advance for the victory that we're going to sustain in you. We just praise you, Father, that even though we don't know exactly what's going to transpire transpire from day to day, we do know that uh, you're omniscient, you're omnipotent, you're omnipresent. So no matter what we deal with, you're here, uh, close by, a loving Father who is looking down upon our circumstances. You didn't allow us to go through this because you don't love us. You don't treasure us. Matter of fact, you treasure us more than we can even imagine. But we thank you, Father, that you're allowing us to go through this, that once again you can sharpen and refine us and even get us to the place where we trust you even more. And once again, we represent you in a more powerful fashion to those who have yet to know you. We pray for many salvations, Father. We thank you, Father, for deliverance and restoration from those who are backslidden. And we give you glory, honor, and praise once again for your divine protection, for your healing, for your provision. And we will endure and we will come out of this better than ever before. We thank you, give you the praise, honor, and glory, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen.